Hellfire Revisited. What is Gehenna? Most modern Bible translations have completely dropped the word hell, except when referring to this concept of Gehenna. This is because the modern idea of hell fire cannot be reasonably related to the Hebrew concept of Sheol, also translated as Hades in Koine Greek. The meaning of hell has changed since it was first used in the English translations of the Bible. Originally, hell was the proper name of a Norse goddess of the dead and the realm of the dead she ruled over. In Germanic languages, hell originally was merely the idea of the realm of the dead, not a torture chamber in eternal fire. Now personally, I don't think it's appropriate to use the name of a pagan goddess to describe the realm of the dead in the Bible at all, but since that was the closest accessible concept recognized by English-speaking people over six centuries ago, it made sense at that time. Today the word hell connotes a very different idea, eternal torture in fire, an idea that is not in the New Testament at all. The oldest Bible translation into modern Latinized English was the Wycliffe Bible in the 14th century. John Wycliffe, translating directly out of the Latin Vulgate, used the word hell a whopping 122 times. Most modern Bible translations only use the word hell about 13 times. This would include the NIV and the NASB and other Bible translations like the ESV. In most instances, the word hell is being used to translate the Greek word Gehenna. The Greek word Tartaros is also translated as hell, leaving me to wonder how in the world these scholars concluded these two ideas are referring to the same concept. In fact, they are completely different concepts in the New Testament. The concept of Tartarus, translated as hell, appears in 2 Peter 2.4. Tartarus is actually Greek mythology used to describe a prison that can hold powerful and wicked spirits. The Apostle Peter is merely using this concept as an accessible idea for his Greek-speaking audience to understand how God is restraining fallen, powerful, angelic spirits. Gehenna is a completely different concept that comes right out of the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. It is referring to the Valley of Hinnom. This valley appears in the following passages in Joshua 15:8 Joshua 18:16 2 Kings 23:10 2 Chronicles 28:3 2 Chronicles 33:6 Nehemiah 11:30 Jeremiah 7:31 Jeremiah 7:32 Jeremiah 19:2 Jeremiah 19:6 Jeremiah 32:35 This Valley of Hinnom Gehenna translated as hell is a very literal historical place here on earth. The Valley of Hinnom is the Old Testament place where the judgment of God came upon the nation of Israel because they were sacrificing their babies to the pagan god Moloch by burning them alive in this same valley. The prophet Jeremiah calls it the Valley of Slaughter. It was a place of total destruction. Gehenna, translated as hell, is the Greek name for the Hebrew Valley of Hinnom, the proper name of a place here on earth. For clarity, Gehenna should be translated as the Valley of Hinnom. That is what the original audience understood. For example, we should read, If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into the valley of Hinnom. Now the context of this saying demands that we understand Jesus is literally referring to the body we are currently living in. Jesus is also specifically speaking to the first century Jewish people. The Gospel of John, specifically written to Gentile Christians, never warns them of the coming destruction of Gehenna. 
the epistles, written primarily to Gentile Christians, never warns them about the coming destruction of Gehenna. A reasonable exegesis of these passages demands we ask why Gentile believers in the first century were not being warned about Gehenna. That is a significant omission if Gehenna is a place of eternal torment and fire called hell. You see, today we have the entire New Testament bound together in a single volume, but the early Christians did not have that advantage. For the apostles to not warn the Gentile believers about a place of eternal punishment and fire called Gehenna is unconscionable if such a place actually existed. In the historical context of the passage, the message is simply this. You are better off losing an eye or a limb than to die in the valley of Hinnom. That was the warning spoken to first century Jewish believers. This was a place of total destruction here on earth. They would have immediately recognized the seriousness of this warning, that it was talking about them here and now. If we were to apply this concept of Gehenna to the afterlife, it would be very supportive of the doctrine of annihilationism and not at all supportive of the doctrine of eternal punishment. But does the context of Gehenna actually confirm this is what God does? Does God annihilate the soul or does God permanently take away spiritual status for all eternity in the afterlife? Are the people of Israel being permanently demoted from their high place in God's kingdom or worse, being completely annihilated from existence? No reasonable interpretation of these passages conveys such an idea. There are only two passages in the New Testament that could possibly give us this idea. Let's take a closer look by reading the entire context of this passage. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. Aren't two sparrows sold for an Asarian coin? Not one of them falls on the ground apart from your father's will, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, don't be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Don't think that I came to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to send peace, but a sword. Jesus is very specifically referring to coming earthly judgment and destruction. For an in-depth synopsis of this topic, I recommend reading The Destruction of Jerusalem by George Peter Holford. Jesus is very specifically referring to what was the coming destruction of Jerusalem as predicted in the Olivet Discourse, as we see in Matthew 24 to 25, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21. Jesus said, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all things have happened. Luke 21, 32. This prophecy, the destruction of Jerusalem, came to pass in that generation exactly as Jesus predicted. But what about the part where it says, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, Matthew 10, 28. Jesus is clearly warning that God can destroy both body and soul in one fell swoop here on earth, but that man can only kill the body. Is Jesus teaching that God annihilates the soul? Or is Jesus merely saying that God has the power to annihilate the soul and therefore we should fear God and not man? Based on the context, the latter is the only reasonable interpretation. Fear God because he alone is all powerful. After making this statement, Jesus appears to contradict himself by saying, aren't two sparrows sold for an Asarian coin? 
Not one of them falls on the ground apart from your father's will, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Therefore, don't be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Matthew 29, 30. Therefore, ironically, the entire point of this passage is that God alone has the power to annihilate both body and soul. Therefore, we should fear God and not man. Then Jesus tells us not to be fearful, for God does not forget even the sparrows that fall, and we are far more valuable than a sparrow. The entire point of the passage is that we should not live our lives in fear because God alone is all powerful. I repeat, the point of the passage is that we should not live our lives in fear because God alone is all powerful. And God cares about us far more than the sparrows and he does not even forget the sparrows. So in reading the entire context of this passage, how in the world could we ever get the idea that Jesus is teaching us about an eternal realm of torture and fire called hell? It's clearly not what the passage is teaching. Simply by reading the entire context of the passage, we can see that idea is patently absurd. Jesus is warning them about bringing a sword to the earth, not a realm of eternal punishment in the afterlife. Jesus is teaching that we should fear God and not man. Jesus is telling us that God alone is worthy of being feared. Then Jesus says, fear not, for God alone is all powerful and you are more valuable than many sparrows, not one of which is ever forgotten by God. That is the message in the passage. It was actually a message of hope during the darkest hour for the people of Israel. Though you may fall like many sparrows, God will never forget any one of you. This passage is not a message of eternal punishment, but rather a message of eternal hope for the people of Israel. As Christians, this is the historical message that we should be applying to all of our lives. This passage has nothing to do with a fictional notion of eternal punishment in hell fire, but rather that we should not live our lives in fear because God alone is all powerful and God does not even forget a single sparrow. How much more valuable are you? God bless you and thank you for listening.